One of the things I love, though, is that you're getting creative about how the word goes further. So you're going to have a debate series that's going to be uh, taking a tour. And I'm excited because Durham, I'm from Durham. You're going to be stopping at different HBCUs. One of them is North Carolina Central and Aggie pride all day. I'm um, <laughs> proud alumni of North Carolina a t State University. Um, and so I'm excited, but I'm wondering, this is a very creative thing to do. Like what sparked wanted to do a debate series? You don't necessarily see that anymore. Um, I think it's a great way because on the internet, we love to argue about things, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but take me back to the moment. Like, take me back to the room where you decided, you know, we're going to do, we're going to travel and do this debate series. What was that thought process like? Erica, I think this was Erica's idea. So you this let, let her tell it. Look, we'd been doing a film and we also did a big payback podcast through the Black Effect with Char that Charlemagne asked us to do. For so long, we did it through COVID and all these other things. And I was looking forward to the impact campaign because whatever we do, including Whitney, Whitney does that with his films. We do it at Color Farm with John Lewis. We did an impact campaign around voting in North Carolina and the, some of the Southern states, he did something called the Whiteness Project where he went around and asked white people about their whiteness after he did, did Two Towns of Jasper. Um, I was looking forward to this impact campaign because I had seen the Baldwin, the James Baldwin um, Buckley, William Buckley debate in 1965 on YouTube. And I just run it all the time. And I said, you know what? Debate is a great place to take the stink off the word reparations because people are afraid to say reparations or even be aligned with it. So. Why not debate it in universities where no one is held hostage to what they think about it? You choose a pro and a con, you got to come with it and debate the question. And from there, we can take the analysis, the data, and all of the information that we gather, including the opinions, and provide it to the movement members that are down on the ground, including Robin Lou Simmons and, and people in Congress, and also the local people as well, and start a community conversation inside a debate where any white person, white or Black, can say what they want how they feel or debate it and do the pro and con thing. And be, believe it or not, the NC-10 was the perfect place to start in North Carolina. They have 10 HBCUs, the most in, of any state. And so we're able to, and also the biggest in, of, of them all, which is the um, NC, what's NC A A A and T. Come on now, wait a minute. Oh, no, <laughs> Let's say it right, okay. North Carolina well, the, the, the largest HBCU. <laughs> And thank you. And also Bennett, which is the smallest. It's a micro college, right. 200 people. We kicked it off at Bennett on purpose. A lot of those Bennett Bells did a lot of the strategy and planning for the civil rights era, and they did not get their due. They got no credit. And Suzanne Walsh, who was one of our biggest supporters in this, and who asked me to do the commencement speech, which we couldn't do last year. But she said, think of this college as... Um, uh, an experimental place to test things. So we said, well, let's test this. We'll test it inside of the HBCU structure. Right. They'll debate it. So they're coming at it in all sorts of ways through step shows, battle, battling rap battles, uh, hair throughout the ages, showing us how we can show the pros and the cons on what reparations is or isn't. And also to what it means to, rep to bring reparations to HBCUs and educational institutions. And we our plan is to go to PD, PD how do you call it? PWIs? PW, yes. White institutions. And yes. they eventually to Cambridge where they had the original one in 1965. Oh, there you go. Brilliant, brilliant. Wow. Uh, Erica, Erica Alexander's here, Whitney Dow. Their film is The Big Payback. It's on PBS. You can actually go to pbs.org and watch it um, or you know wherever PBS is in your area. Uh, area. Um, March 16th, which is in two days, you will be at uh, Maxine Shaw's University. I think that's, uh, is that, is that Shaw, Shaw University in Raleigh? <laughs> you, you said actually, that's hilarious. We will be there. Absolutely. And we will also be at what, North Carolina? No. We'll North be Carolina Central uh, on that same day, North Carolina <laughs> Central you. University Thank on you. Monday. You're well, going to be at Johnson. I got you. What? Yeah, Come well, on, talk. On Thursday, because it's that's important because that's Reverend Barber. Bishop Barber will be at that debate. He's one of our debate coaches. So is Joy mm -hmm. Reed. So he'll be North at Carolina Central or at Shaw? North Carolina Central. OK, that's Reverend Barber and Joy, Joy Reed. No, Reverend Barber will be there. Joy Reed is one of our debate coaches online. We've been building this for a couple of months. So these we've had all sorts of planning. But wait, so Reverend Barber is going to physically be there. 
Yes. On Thursday at That's North Carolina right. Central. That's right. Amazing. Okay. Monday, Johnson C. Smith, which yes. is in Charlotte, and yes. Livingstone College in Salisbury. Salis- Salisbury. All of them, yes. Okay. On Tuesday, next Tuesday, St. Augustine's University, Raleigh, North Carolina, a- AT&T. No, I'm just playing. Uh-uh. A&T. I'm, just just playing. I'm just playing. I'm just playing with you. I'm playing. I'm playing at State University. Um, <laughs> N-C-A-T, whatever. Okay. That one in Greensboro. Uh, that's next Tuesday. And okay. then next Wednesday, Fayetteville State University. I'm going in- to Fayetteville, unfortunately. Or- no, Fayetteville. Okay. City. Or Winston-Salem? Yes. No, no, okay. no. Winston-Salem, yes. Not Fayetteville or Elizabeth City. But the other ones are all on board. By the way, I- go ahead. Keep going. And then I think we're done, right? Yeah, we are. Go ahead. Tell me our partner. We should say when you can tell them a little bit is Ben and Jerry's Ben and Jerry's is one of the yes. loan companies that is not afraid to do social justice issues or social issues, human rights issues. And they partnered with us to make this happen. They will be scooping out root beer, root beer, root beer floats for reparations now and also giving out the uh, the um, the ice cream in celebration of the opportunity for people to join the third reconstruction as Reverend Barber would put it and lend their uh, powers, their mind, their thought, their energy to this question that help holds America back in the world. I love it. Um, I always ask this question. Just go ahead, say, I'm sorry. Okay, in, so you can actually, people want to see the film, they can go two things. They can go right now to our, to our website, bigpaybackmovie.com, bigpaybackmovie.com. Not only is there a link to watch the film for free now, but there's also a schedule of all these debates and um, they're open to the public. They're not just for the schools. Well, at That's Bennett, true. there were hun- there's at least a hundred community members there. Reparations is not confined to a particular institution it is a community it is a needs it's a community lift and so if you're interested in if you're in town at any of those communities and you want to come absolutely come out and turn and join us yes okay i love that big payback i know we have a little bit just a little bit of time i, I wanted to ask you um whitney dow uh what was your road to damascus what what was the thing that woke you up and i'm, I'm struggling with this with this uh, on the air i want to dismantle whiteness because whiteness is a power construct right uh-huh. and if we can get people to not be identified as white or as black but as people or as americans or whatever i feel like we can start to have a conversation but you said i'm a white man in my community there's a tiedness to this thing that's more of a power structure and a system than it is an individual or even a race because when i ask people to define what does it mean to be white they cannot what is whiteness why does what is white culture they can't even define it Mm. that's actually it's really interesting you say that and and this project that erica mentioned the whiteness project i've done about 300 oral histories of white people asking just that question what makes you white what is it that white? Is it how I look? Is it the way I live in the world? Is it my DNA? All these things. And everybody's struggling with the construct because, it, of course, it's a, race is a construct. We're all living it. But the reality is we're also living inside that construct. So when you ask, what is my road? My road, like any road, has had many stops. You know, it started with growing up in Boston during during the 70s, during busing, which you've been to Boston, Karen. Yeah, it's 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 a really wild and seeing in real time, a community that I sort of thought is like a, a moral community acting completely immorally, and that was destabilizing. I went down to Jasper, Texas after the murder of James Byrne Jr., who was dragged to death uh, by three men in 1998. One was just executed last week, I believe. Yes, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah, John, John William King. And I drove down that road and saw where all the different body parts were found. And it so profoundly rocked me. That was the first movie I well, made. Well, why I did you do head. that, though? Because, you know, to, to, to even want to do that, that. And that's one of the most horrific stories you can ever hear of a man walking along a road. And people thought it was funny to tie him, chain him to the back of a pickup truck and drive for miles over rocky roads until his torso and teeth and everything till body parts fell off um, in America. Not too long ago. Why did you want to even go? Tell that story. And that's, that's what I, you know, I really appreciate you asking that question. And I'll confess something to you here, Karen. I went there for selfish reasons. I went there because I had seen the story. I wanted to make a movie. I'd seen the story on TV. I saw the cowboy sheriff with his big hat. I said, this could be a movie. But that trip down that road transformed me. And I, it, where it rocked me to my core to actually see where it takes. And then what really rocked me is when I talked to the people in the town, small town, 7,000 people, and white people had this one narrative where 
you know, God chose this to happen here because we are such a righteous Christian community that no other community could support something so horrific. They saw that it was not connected to them at all. And the black uh, uh, JASP residents were like, this is just another stop on the train. They've been doing to us for centuries here. The only thing difference between this murder and every other murder that's happened here, every other killing, is that the press showed up here. That's the only difference. And so that set off this journey where I actually ended up making the film with a friend of mine, Marco Williams, a black filmmaker, where I just filmed white people, he just filmed black people, and another step the road to Damascus, when we tried to put the footage together, Marco, I've known since I was 14, went to the same high school. The other guy lived in my house when I was a kid. We couldn't agree on reality. And that's, we could not literally agree on how do you cut something together where you can't agree on reality that you both looked at the same thing. And that again was destabilizing. And um, again, with the Whiteness Project, um, hearing white people in anguish. And I know this is like to talk to black people and say white people in anguish, but they are over this. It is something that is corrosive inside. And I see it over and over again in these conversations with white people about their relationship to their own race. And then finally, a little girl asked me uh, about 10, 15 years ago, when I was doing a talk, um, a young Puerto Rican girl, you know, what did you learn about your own race uh, doing all these projects? And I realized in that moment, nothing. I hadn't learned anything. I thought I was like most white people. I thought I was outside it. I thought I was like the good liberal, like these bad racists need to be taken care of and these poor black people need to be lifted up and I'm just the man to do it. And she transformed my world. And it was that stupid, like getting the stupid red pill. I suddenly could see the matrix of how it worked. And that's when I sort of started trying to do projects that would try and bend that matrix a little bit, but you know, you know, life is a journey, and there's a lot of there's a you know, there's no one come to Jesus moment, but there's been a lot of them along the way, and you know, hopefully, I get a little closer each time. Thank you for sharing uh, that because yeah. I feel like actually the white liberals are a large part of our problem. Like if you're just extreme racist, we see you, we got you. You know what I'm saying? It ain't right, but we can see it. It's it's exactly the narrative that you just said about well, no, these poor people, they just need. And that is exactly the problem. So this, it sounds like when you move to doing this on PWI campuses and doing this on HBCU campuses, I'll be interested to see if you see the same effect. If you see the same effect of the what you saw in the stark difference between what the white residents had to say and what the black residents had to say. I mm. mean, if you I want to really get funky with it, I'm interested in like, if this is not black and black people debating and this is black on white people debating, like everybody's debating on these different ways. One of the things you mentioned, Erica, was the question that you're going to be asking. I don't think you said stated the actual question. Is it just reparations or not? What is the question you're going to be asking at this debate that is going to uh, change the world? Well, the question actually is chosen by each university. So we don't get to choose the question. We just ask them to be created with the methods of how they debate to make it fun to make it communal, to make it so the students have an experience to invite the community, but they get to choose from their point of view. And so each person will have a different, each school will have a different personality inside of that question and certainly how they present it. I love and it. So, you know, what's so fascinating about your, your question is that, yeah, like, is it a pro or con debate? It might be, but also like, what are reparations and having, because if you go to certain, you know, HBCUs, a lot of people are agreeing on it, but we can tell you from doing the movie, Black, most black people don't agree on what it is, who should get it, what form it should be in, how much it should be, who's delivering it, all those things. And I think that that's part of, in some ways, you know, white people have the easy job in this. We just have to get on board. We have to get on board and and say, this is something we want to do and want to allocate resources to it. The black community has a much more complicated job that we don't have standing to be part of, which is what actually would repair this? How, if we let's say we allocate X dollars, uh, William Darity says it's what 16 to 20 trillion dollars. What would we do with this money that actually would create repair? And that's a really complicated question. Well, let's get there first. I, I say let's not spend a whole lot of time arguing about that. Let's get to the point that we actually uh, get H HR 40 passed and uh, uh, let's have the discussion. We haven't even agreed that we should have the repair. Let's get to there first. Um, 